Hello, Ryan here, and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all of the news from the week just past. Be sure to subscribe if you like what you see, and let's get on with it. This week, Inside Star Citizen takes the first look at the Nick system and current progress with the Drake Vulture. Star Citizen Live covers topics such as the persistent hangars, the cargo refactor and selling, plus Alpha 314 has finally gone live. Not a week to be missed. So this week's Inside Star Citizen begun with a new segment for the show called Origin Stories, introducing us to the developers of Star Citizen. This week's origin story, or the initial origin story, was with CIG's producer, Steph Bedford, talking about her journey in game development. Now, I highly recommend watching this if it is something that you are into, and as much as I do love to see more gameplay orientated segments, it is always great to meet the many faces that make the Star Citizen dream a reality. More importantly, Steph did mention that they are working on the Starfighter Ares, and they have just started white boxing the Drake Vulture which is a dream to hear. They are working on this ship now and it is coming along well. One of my favorite ships that I do own, thankfully. Uh, we also got to see a little bit of the Starlifter A2 with its interior Bombay, which looks like it's coming along nicely. And they are still, I think, developing the size three bombs to go with it. So for the sprint report this week, we took a look at the Starfarer refueling, which is currently in active development. We heard about this quite recently. Here we can see the EUPU feature team building on top of work already done by the EU vehicle tech team for docking. What they're trying to do is see if they can use the docking system for the fuel boom arm. Now there is still a lot of work to do, but the foundation is in place. So expect to see the work on this continue over the next few months. And I am so grateful that they are getting the Starfarer set up with its actual role in the burst. Next up, we saw some work prototyping a new bombing system which again is necessary for craft like the A2. Here they are taking missiles and turning them into bombs to see how they can get this working. They are currently underway for developing the bomb operator mode that will allow players to place more precision on drops, as well as other features like limited guidance capabilities and exploring other potential options. Very excited to see this come along and I love what they named the bombs. After this, we saw work being done for flying while intoxicated, which includes a delay in player input, penalties for input severity, so meaning the harder that you try and fight this, the harder it will get to control, as well as a variable inserted at random. And then when they turn on the double vision visual effects, it becomes a whole other ball game. Don't drink and fly. Work continues on the Aegis Redeemer. Here we can see the grey box progress of the remote turret bay, the manned turrets, habitation module, armory, machine section, and the final art progress on the rear entranceway. I will leave that going in the background for a little bit. Next up, we got to see concepts for the upcoming Crusader showroom, which is kind of a one-stop shop to learn about all of the past and present Crusader ships, but also built to allow any new released Crusader ships to be rotated in, like, as Jared says, the Starliner one day. Was that a hint? Who knows? And finally, we got to see a current look at the upcoming planets of the Nyx system. What we can see here is the height map painting process, and as this process has evolved over the years, they can really create something far more natural and unique. And as Jared says, it will be a while before we see Nyx in the PU, which a lot of us were thinking maybe we'll see Nyx and Pyro at the same time. I think that kind of confirms we won't, but they will continue to follow along with its progress over the following months. And this is looking phenomenal. So another great episode of Inside Star Citizen. Let's get to Star Citizen Live as it's going to take a while. So this week's Star Citizen Live was a beast of a Star Citizen Live with the USPU features team, with the first questions being around the cargo refactor. First question is, what is the cargo refactor? Now, before we get to that answer, the cargo refactor has been an ongoing task for CIG, and the work on this, according to the progress tracker on the roadmap, will finish around the end of November, beginning of December. 
Now what this cargo refactor does, it allows CIG to fully physicalize the cargo boxes, meaning they are actually there in the ship on the cargo grid and can be interacted with, stolen, loaded or unloaded. This will allow us to use tractor beams to move them around or jettison the cargo and it will be cargo boxes of other sizes as well, which include the actual one standard cargo unit boxes too, not just these smaller ones that we kind of have now. This is all coming together alongside the looting and inventory and of course the dedicated tractor beam as well. And as you can imagine, this refactor will be for the many commodities that are found throughout the verse that we can trade. But it will also apply to the personal inventory containers as well, meaning that you will be able to trade any looted items that you find, not just commodities bought at a terminal. Now the next question is, will we be able to take other people's cargo both forcibly or by permission? And also will the saddlebags on the prospector or mole be removable? So firstly, as long as you have access to their cargo hold, then yes, you can steal it or take it. For the saddlebags, they said it will also allow us to detach and let someone pick them up and trade them or store them. It is an all-inclusive system. This obviously opens up a lot more piracy, being able to steal the saddlebags or cargo boxes. But something to consider is that the cargo boxes or any container will be damageable and will degrade, just like anything else in the game. So you won't be able to just simply blow up a ship as you could damage and then devalue the very items that you're planning to steal. Next question, will there be a Lego style sort of snap to option to get the boxes stacked nice and tidy? Now this is something that they would like eventually, but for the first drop, it is unlikely that this will be the case. It does require other teams to help in this area, but the cargo refactor has been set up to allow this, so do expect it. Next question, will the cargo refactor include a meaningful overhaul to the economy itself? And they said, yes, it has to, it is pretty much mandatory. And I've been saying this now for a little while, one of the reasons why we probably haven't seen much in way of fixes to the current commodity trading aspect of the PU is probably because they don't want to waste time trying to hotfix bits of it now when they have this more fully established long-term system coming in. Next question, in space, how do you plan to protect player ships from people trying to get on board while you are manually unloading and loading cargo? Now they say this is up to the players to protect themselves. Whether you have other players or NPCs helping or you stick to the safer trade lanes is up to you. Reputation may play a part in this as well, having NPCs and turrets coming to your aid or protecting you depending on where you are. Obviously, if you are in a hangar, it'll be extremely difficult to gain access to someone else's hangar as you'll have to sneak in with them. You won't be able to access someone else's hangar by just simply pressing the button on the elevator. But they did say they will monitor how it goes and see if they need to adjust anything like additional security systems. So I guess you might be able to hide yourself amongst their cargo and get wheeled in or stealth your way in some way, maybe on board their ship. It will be quite hard, but it'll still be a potential way of doing things. And it is also the reason why in my org, before we go or head off anywhere with a ship of a certain size, we will do a thorough sweep of the ship to ensure that no one is on board who shouldn't be. Next question is, where do the cargo decks come into all of this? Now, they say the original idea of cargo decks were to be used as a place to rent space for storing cargo. And they have since discussed the possibilities of managing how we go about this and how we could be charged for storing the cargo there. So expect it to change a little bit from the original concept as they continue to develop the cargo mechanics. But these stations do have hangars. So it could be that you pay to use one of them for a period of time, go and do your shopping and then come back. But they did say the cargo feature is quite huge and they will need to make sure that the cargo decks match along the way. Now, I personally think the best use case for cargo decks, which is probably the, their intention anyway, is just to have them serve as the main cargo ports for the main landing zones. And then all of the other cities, towns and points of interest and locations on the planet can have the cargo distributed from these places. So have these decks to allow the bigger ships to dock and unload for players and NPCs and then have missions for smaller ships to maybe pick up and distribute the cargo to the necessary planet side locations. A bit like how a container ferry hauls the huge loads of cargo to the docks and then the trucks will come and just distribute them. I think this is the plan all along anyway, but there could be other use cases for cargo decks later down the line. And the final question for the cargo refactor is, does the cargo refactor include the store all boxes for the Aurora? And they say, yes, it will. That is wonderful. So happy to hear that.
Now the next set of questions are relating to the persistent hangers. And the first one is, what is the difference between a persistent hanger and a personal hanger? Now a personal hanger is a play around hanger within a given location and the persistent hangers, which we are getting first, is an allocated hanger at a landing zone where players can kind of call it their own and use it for whatever they need. So be that scoring ships, cargo, personal items and so on. It is pretty much a very similar thing and it's the first concept of personal hangers, but it is ones that are already built at space stations or main landing ports. It is your hangar. It'll allow players to manage larger amounts of cargo, storing them inside the hangar. And it will be a place where you can store things and come back to, to the point where you could leave something just lying around on the floor. When you return, it is still there. They will also be able to use these types of hangars for missions and mission givers, which is good, having allocated hangars to pick up or drop off for specific mission items. And they say that hangars will eventually become part of your everyday interactions, just like how your ships are. They will be part of you, who you are, where you can go, and so on and so forth. Now, the work on persistent hangars continues all the way through till February next year. So they're not coming this year, but they are something to look forward to in 2022. Now, they say to get this working with the landing zones, which currently have a limited number of hangars, and pretty much not enough to even cover the current 50 players per server, they will basically allocate you a hangar at your chosen location, and then you can access this at any time that you want. But once you enter it, it kind of magically moves you out of the way so that other players can come and enter their own hangars. But to give a sense of it being more physical and personal, they will ensure that every time you want to access or leave your hangar, you will be using the same exit or entrance every time, which is going to be a nice touch. Now, they have said in the past, and they did mention it here too, that they do have the planetary real estate or land volume for landing zones to actually create full-on physical hangars that each player could buy and own. That'll be much later down the road, but the system that they are creating can support this, and this will probably drive a bit more in terms of actual real estate. So the prices of hangars being more expensive somewhere based on supply and demand. But for now, it is just going to be a kind of magical system to allow you to access it. Next question, will we be able to give other players access to drop off cargo in our hangars? And they say, yes, the hangars all come with freight elevators that are tied to whoever it is using it. So if you are the one in the freight elevator, you will have access to your inventory. And then if someone else uses that elevator, they can access theirs. So this will allow players to load their cargo into the freight elevator, but take it to say someone else's hangar and load it into their ship. It also means that cargo will not magically spawn inside your ship anymore. It'll be delivered to your hangar via the freight elevator and then you and your friends will have to manually move that into your ship. Now in the future, they will introduce cargo drones and NPCs that can be hired to help load all this stuff in and out. But for the initial implementation, it'll be just players using trolleys and multi-tools. God forbid any solo haulers using a caterpillar. Now the next question is, will the need to equip ships only with the inventory inside your hangar be implemented at the same time. And they say this is actually releasing with the personal inventory system and asset manager, which should be around the 315 mark. The VMA will be altered to show only what items you have available at that particular location. And then the asset manager will tell you where your other items are located so you can fly there and gain access to that inventory. Next question is how do prisons factor into all of these changes? For example, when you escape, how do you get your inventory back? Now, you will get everything back once you get back to your hangar or the places where you can retrieve your stuff, but they still need to determine where the goods that you had on you at the time of capture will go. As mentioned before with the asset manager, this will tell you where each of your items are located and where you need to go to get them. Final question for persistent hangers. Can we filter our inventories via text? Now, they said it will allow for text filtering, but only local results. So what is in your current location rather than your global inventory, which they may be able to enable at a later date. We will also be able to filter by type and subtype like clothing and trousers and so on, which will be a big win. So the next few questions are relating to selling. First question is what is the plan for selling, trading and shopping, etc. So firstly, selling on the progress tracker is currently well into development and the work on this comes to a close around the end of November, beginning of December. So a lot of this stuff is all coming to a close around the same time, which will tie in nicely for the release. 
They are trying to close off these game loops and they say the next logical and necessary step is selling. Being able to sell components, weapons, personal items all back to the shops, which of course ties into the looting system. Now the goal they say is to start with limited items that the stores would have for sale already like weapons, armor, components and so on. But the ability to sell ships back to a dealership is something that they will come a bit later on. This will also be using the kiosk and they will try and make it as user friendly as possible. So being able to stack and sell in bulk. Plus it will only be stuff that you have either on your person or in your local storage like your hangar at that landing zone. Not something that's in a completely different landing zone. Next question, will we be able to trade between ourselves? Now, yes, this is the plan. They will be expanding the Mo Trader app, which allows you to send money to someone uh, to allow players to trade items between themselves. With talk of even having shipping times associated with this. So you could be in one system trading with someone in another system. And if they buy something of yours, then they will need to hire someone to ship it to them. Be that an NPC shipping company or a player which I think is a great touch. And the final question is again, just asking more about selling ships. Now the plan is of course to allow players to sell ships back to dealerships or to other players, but they did mention that taking ships to junk sites and scrapping them will be necessary, especially for pirates. So the next lot of questions are now talking about reputation. First one being, will there be more reputation stuff for people on the wrong side of the law? And they say, yes, absolutely. And it's not that far off either. They are actively working on this now, but of course, no dates just yet. They do plan to support reputation for pretty much all aspects of Star Citizen, be that hauling cargo, mining, salvaging, shooting people as pirates and so on and so forth. Pyro is more of an outlaw system, so it'll be much more relevant when that system does come in as well. Probably opening up a lot more missions for pirates as a home base to go and come to. Now, the next question is, will reputation affect selling prices or taxes? And they say, yes, absolutely. This is one of the core perks of the reputation system, like what we see with the bounty hunting rewards. Maybe a specific shop, person or a company that will give you better prices or deals based on your reputation with them. They also plan to hide things behind reputation walls. Maybe if you reach a certain rep with someone, you will then have more options of items to buy. They also mentioned for the 314 Xeno Threat missions, they will be directly rewarding players with stuff at certain reputations once the event is done. But this won't be a long term thing, it is just a one off. So if you want to gain some cool stuff, do take part in the Xeno Threat mission. So the next set of questions is relating to the Nine Tails event. The first one is Does the Nine Tails lockdown trigger from in game actions or is it triggered by CIG manually? Now, the current version is manually set. They do want to have it scheduled maybe by date and time, but they also want it to eventually get to the point where these types of events are triggered automatically by varied circumstances within the game. For example, increased piracy in an area or doing missions for an org like the Nine Tails to help them gather enough resources to then trigger this event. They want all events like these to be driven by the simulation and by players' actions rather than manually triggered, which will be a really nice addition to the whole system. Final question for Ninetales. When the Ninetales lock down a station or location, will players still be able to spawn there? And currently, yes, you will still spawn in the same location regardless, but in the future, this may change. So the final set of questions for Star Citizen Live is to do with the procedural character generation. And as you can imagine, the first question is, what is the procedural character generation? Now, this is part of a much larger initiative of Tony Zurevex regarding dynamic populations and the virtual AI. They know they won't be able to hand author all of the NPC characters in the game for all the many locations, planets and systems to the scale and dynamism that they want. So procedural character generation is a tool to handle this. So using this, they will create a set of rules to create the characters for all the locations that are varied but make sense to that location. Basically, they want characters to look like they belong to a particular system or planet. So you can see someone and kind of instinctively recognize that this person is native 
to this system or to this planet, but also have the system varied enough to garner a population. So adding DNA and culture to characters which influence their behaviours and preferences, which we did hear about I think back in 2017, which is a really cool system. But also what is cool about this whole system is that the characters that they do create will be persistent. So you'll be able to run into them again and again, depending on where you are and where they are. So that was Star Citizen Live. Some amazing stuff being talked of there. Most of which is actually sounding like it's coming to fruition towards the end of this year and into early next year. And I think a lot of what they're talking about here, we will actually see at CitizenCon for their panels. So I am really excited for the latter half of this year. If any of this stuff comes in, I will be very happy. I do plan to break down a lot of what they spoke about here. In particular, the persistent hangers and cargo refactor and create individual videos talking further about them and what that means for Star Citizen. But that was Star Citizen Live. Let us move on. So also this week, the latest law post titled The Payout was released. August Subflare was distributed to all RSI subscribers. This month, it was a selection of three multi-tool skins. Both the Persistent Universe and Squadron 42 monthly reports were released, both of which I have covered in dedicated videos that I will link in the description below should you want to watch them. And finally, with the release of Alpha 314 to the live servers, there were a lot of new posts. Firstly, the RSI Constellation Taurus went on sale, which introduced a new short commercial and some cool imagery. There is a new referral bonus for anyone who uses a referral code or has their referral code used, granting them a shiny new Drake Dragonfly with the incendiary coal fire paints, which I will say does look pretty cool. There is a new sale going for the ships of Crusader, which include the Area Starfighters, the Mercury Star Runner, C2, M2 and Genesis Starliner, should you want to pick those up. They have also put many of the missile centric ships and vehicles available to purchase again like the Cyclone MT, the Talon Shrike, the Ballista and the Freelancer Miss. Plus, there is some new official merchandise, including a new shirt and top, a mug and Finlay the Stormwall plushie, which I have to admit, I did pick one up myself. Pico needed a friend. And finally, to officially welcome Alpha 314, we have the Welcome to Orison post with the full patch notes and breakdown of what's new, plus a Discover Orison post which takes you on a tour of the city and its history and should not be missed. Go full screen, get your headphones on. It's a pretty incredible job that they've done there. So that brings us to the end of the show. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button. Also, I am able to do this thanks to my very generous patrons and channel members. If you appreciate what I do and would like to help make it even better from as little as $1 a month, all of the links are provided below.